Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to this event on online content moderation. My name is Brent Eastwood, and I work for R Street Institute. And we're excited today for this panel of all stars in the field. I'll introduce everyone in a moment, but allow me to set the stage and get you all in the mood for this event. I'm a recovering political scientist, so <laughs> I'm still suffering a little bit, but I still love polls and surveys. So let me take a small survey right now. How many of you this morning logged in or checked your social media networks, your social feeds? Okay, so look at that, everybody checked. Okay, how many of you actually posted something? You did, okay. Was it hate speech? <laughs> did you say how great our street is? All right, thank you, thank you. You see, that's good. You have a little voice inside your head. Your conscience tells you to stay away from adverse content that could hurt anyone or incite damage against you or anyone. But our problem is the bots and the trolls. And they're making untrue and hateful statements to include misinformation and disinformation. So how do we combat that? Well, the first thing is the need to define misinformation and disinformation. Is it harmful or innocent? Is it lawful or unlawful? Is it free speech? Or does it need to be taken down and censored? How does it damage democracy, journalism, and a free civil society? Some damaging speech is left up because it's lawful but awful. But what is lawful and what is awful? Do community notes on X do a good enough job to police harmful and untrue content on that platform? The Constitution and the First Amendment make no mention of speech that is wrong, misguided, false, or comprised of conspiracy theories. So it is a difficult mission for these social media platforms to use content moderation policies that squares free speech with fake or harmful content, especially speech that advocates harm for someone. So what if some of our most reputable news sources engage in misinformation and disinformation? The New York Times and BBC have spread false reports about the war in Israel and Gaza. It is thus difficult to find a source you can trust these days. So to further examine these issues, I wanted to introduce you to our keynote speaker today. Ashkin Kazarian has investigated this area for several years and is a recognized expert in the field. Ash is a senior fellow for Free Speech and Peace at Stand Together. Before that, she was content policy manager on the content regula regulation team at Meta, so she has experienced content moderation firsthand in the trenches. She created a successful podcast as director of civil liberties at Tech Freedom. Ash has been an expert commentator in news outlets across television, radio, podcasts, and print and digital media including CNBC, BBC, Fox, DC, Newsy, Politico, Axios, and many others. She's a graduate of Yale Law School and with a Master of Law degree and is completing her PhD in law. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Ashkin Kazarian to our event today. I should just have you follow me around. Like, that's so nice. I'm doing PR for you. Um, and thank you for saying few years and not a couple of decades at this point. <laughs> um, thank you everyone uh, for coming. Thank you everyone who's tuning in. Thank you R Street for hosting. I'm really looking forward to the panel debate afterwards. I myself am here today to talk about how I was framed when I was in elementary school. So in second grade, one of my classmates, Lola, she had this beautiful pen with feathers and crystals and one day it went missing. We all started looking for it and I found it under my desk. Uh, gave it to the teacher right away. Everyone thought I was the one who stole it. Of course, it wasn't me. It was this boy, Ivan, who planted it under my desk. No one believed me, not the teachers, not my parents, not my classmates. Like years later, my dad would still gift me nice pens because I think he thought I was lacking. <laughs> um, and that was, I think, a defining moment. Genuinely, I think, that and the fall of free speech in Russia are was led me to law school and working in regulation of the internet sphere together. And I think about that every time there is a debate or a conversation I'm having about free speech. We all carry our experiences, the history of where we grew up that ranks for us in the 
pyramid of human rights where free speech falls. For me, it falls at the top because every time I think about that poor little girl who was filled with rage over the injustice and unfairness and no one would hear her out. So this pyramids and different evaluations of equities are what drives our debates about free speech. And then something comes in and shakes it up even more, the internet. In my opinion, the greatest invention since the printing press. It changed the way our society operates. It gave voice to those who didn't have it. It elevated so many communities. It created industries. The impact can never be measured because the impact is everywhere. At the same time, I mean, I'm a woman on the internet. There is a lot of negative things that do arise. I think the internet has served as a magnifying glass instead of the problem itself that just elevated all the horrible things we have in our society. How do we combat that? How do we address that without making without silencing the voices? How do we make sure that it's a balanced and fair society? Those are the questions that a lot of people are trying to answer, and I think the panel is gonna get into that in depth. I personally see it as three different actors who can contribute here. We have governments, we have platforms, and we have our civil society, people, users, whatever you wanna call it. And Let's start with a government. Let's start with a Goliath. Uh, there is a lot of regulation that happens across the world. Um, one of the big ones this year is obviously EU. I think they love regulating. <laughs> but uh, the Digital Services Act has gone into effect and it's now something that most big platforms have to comply with and some mid-sized too, depending on a bunch of different factors. But then I look at India. So India's IT rules have been a very crucial and important battle that I think is not getting enough coverage here in the United States and just overall in the Western Hemisphere. And Indian government is operating from a place of power because they know how important their market is for not only big platforms, but also the ones that are trying to develop. It's this game of chicken they're playing where honestly the future of innovation and free speech online is at stake. I don't know who's gonna blink first. We are trying to answer these questions to make sure the fabric of our society stays intact. And which brings me to, you talked about lawful but awful speech, so that obviously was a trigger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which brings me to United States. United States has always been the country whatever you want to say about it, that has had uh, the strongest First Amendment and free speech protections in the world. Um, it wasn't written in the Constitution itself, all the little details, but it was developed by the Supreme Court over the course of many years, and it wasn't always um, you know, as strong as it is now. But this is the moment where I think free speech protections are at its height. That can change soon, and I'll talk about it in a second. And as we have had those protections in place, uh, something happened in 1996. Representative Chris Cox, a Republican, and a Representative Ron Wyden, a Democrat, had a fun little conversation. And I'm sorry if you heard about Section 230 before, but we have to say it. It's like Beetlejuice. It's going to appear. Um, <laughs> they, um, they were inspired by a couple of cases that uh, just happened on uh, lower levels in courts. One of them was Prodigy, the other one was CompuServe. In uh, one case, there was Stratton Auckland, the, the firm, the trading firm of Jordan Belfort, remember Wolf of Wall Street? Um, so, well, apparently people on online forums were saying that he's a fraud <laughs> and he sued the platform itself. Since that platform was already moderating content and trying to do something, and this is mid nineties and they were not able to keep up with volume, but they were, putting tools in place to make the, the, you know, the environment somewhat tolerable, uh, court found that they were liable. And then the other platform that actually did nothing, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil, they weren't found liable at all. That felt like the wrong incentive. So 
Section 230, which ended up being named after some, you know, boring congressional proceedings, um, was put into place. And without doubt, and sounding dramatic, it changed the course of history, and it defined and made the internet we know right now possible. Now, it was pretty low-key and in peace, even when I was in law school. I remember so vividly studying this in class one day. And, you know, it was maybe a 20-minute discussion, and we moved on to screaming fire, fire in a crowded theater. But then um, 2016 happened. So 20 years later, our political discourse has reached a uh, boiling point. And everyone was pointing fingers, both Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents. What ended up happening was Section 230 has become this avatar of everything we don't like about tech platforms. Now listen, on my bad day, I don't know if I can make content moderate decisions better than Mark Zuckerberg, but I think even on my bad day, I can do it better than Elon Musk. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a balance, and we all have our own vision, right? Our own pyramid of values and hu of human rights that we think the internet should look like. But Section 230 has given these platforms a tool to create uh, the environments that they want, and we as users then decide if we want to stay on them or not. We've now seen an avalanche of legislation. I've genuinely lost count of every bill in every congressional session that happens. And when you look to the states, I mean, that's a whole separate story. We have currently, in, well, in 2021, Texas and Florida passed two laws that are about to be heard at the Supreme Court. And those are the ones that are going to definitely help define and solidify what digital free speech protections do we have. Um, in short, uh, Texas uh, said that you cannot, as a platform, uh, moderate a viewpoint. Now, what is a viewpoint? They didn't say. So, can be everything. Can be some horrible speech um, that platforms no longer can moderate. Florida said that um, if you are a politician or a candidate for office, uh, your speech cannot be taken down. You have a right to be on these platforms. I wonder what inspired them to pass that. Um, that went through court system. We got a circuit split, um, which is like a bingo for anyone who's been in law school. And we're going to see how this plays out. In my personal opinion, based on current constitution <laughs> of the Supreme Court, um, more justices believe that platforms have ed editorial rights, First Amendment editorial rights, and can moderate however they see fit. No one is even going to get to the question of Section 230, which, by the way, is a federal law in Trump's state laws. We're not even getting there. This is all about the First Amendment right now. What I'm worried about, if we do something wrong, if we tinker with the Internet here in the United States, it's going to have a cross-contamination effect across the world. I mean, it already has. So the DSA in the European Union, right, I've seen it copy-pasted in Costa Rica at an attempted regulation. Uh, and now it's important to understand cross-contamination to someone might sound like harmonization, but in reality, it means that you're taking tools of a society that has a very specific legal system and a very, its own stage of democratic development and giving it to governments and developing countries that you know, have tendencies to go authoritarian. Uh, a good example can be uh, Brazil under President Bolsonaro was trying to pass this misinformation law that basically would give government power to say what was misinformation and then force platforms to take it down. That doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Now again, let me be clear. Platforms are not saints, but also when we say platforms, we don't just mean Facebook and Instagram, i.e. Meta or Twitter, i.e. X, everyone is rebranding, huh? Um, or Discord or Reddit. I mean, every single piece of content and website on the internet is depending on us getting this right. And I, because of how I grew up and where I grew up, don't think that government will ever be the best judge of that. Also, as we've learned, uh, you know, political winds change. And then 
your political opponents have the tools that you've created for them to reshape the information um, fabric of a, of a discussion. If we're trying to protect the public discord, uh, discourse and civil liberties, we need to focus on strengthening our civil society. We are in a digital realm. You go outside of DC, most people don't even know uh, basic things about cybersecurity or how the internet works. We haven't developed digital citizenship and strengthened our society to then make informed decisions and support informed policies behind how our future should look. So that's my plea to all of you. I know ChatGPT and every single other, uh, you know, awful but lawful piece of speech that we see online pushes us to want to do something about that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I think we should be making those informed decisions so we don't break the internet and with it the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ash, that was great. Uh, our panelists could come up to the stage uh, at this time and make yourself comfortable. All right, thank you again, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna make some introductions to the panel. So off to my left is Jennifer Huddleston. Jennifer is a technology policy research fellow at the Cato Institute. Her research focuses on the intersection of emerging technology and law with a particular interest in the interactions between technology and the administrative state. Jennifer's work has been published in USA Today, National Review, Chicago Tribune, Slate, Real Clear Policy, and US News and World Report. She's also written articles for some of the best law journals in the country. Next, we have Paul sitting in the middle. Paul is a professor, Paul Gowder, that is, is a professor of law at Northwestern University School of Law. His research focuses on the rule of law, democratic theory, social and racial equality, institutional governance, law and technology, and classical Athenian and political thought. So I'm going to ask you about that because I think that's fantastic. <laughs> He has served in private practice as a civil rights and legal aid lawyer and represented clients who are victims of police misconduct, predatory lending, employment discrimination, and numerous other injustices. Paul has published three books. His brand new one is called The Networked Leviathan, <laughs> which gets an award for best cover. And he'll talk about that today. Uh, next to my left is Shannon McGregor. She's an associate professor in the University of North Carolina School of Journalism and Media. Shannon is also the principal investigator at UNC Center for Information, Technology, and Public Life. And her research addresses the role of social media and politics with a focus on political communication, journalism, public opinion, and gender. And she's been published in some of the best journals in her field. So let's get to it, and Paul, I'll start out with you because you have that new book out. And what is the premise and how does that fit in with our discussion today? Yeah. Okay, so it's incredibly dangerous to ask an academic to lead a panel by talking about their new book. I would <laughs> desperately try not to filibuster this whole thing. Um, but essentially the idea of the book is I think there's a, a shocking amount of actual agreement, particularly once we leave the United States, about both interests and ideals in the field of content governance, right? You know, take as a sort of quintessential example of harms related to internet content, you know, the obvious case is the genocide in Myanmar, right? No, so take, you know, here's the sort of basic story of the genocide in Myanmar is, you know, facilitated by Facebook's dominant market position in the country by a variety of technical failings in content moderation there. But I take it that regardless of how libertarian you are, how authoritarian you are, right? There's nobody on earth who thinks that the military of Myanmar has a right, free speech or otherwise, to produce hate speech that leads to a genocide. I take it that you know the most critical skeptics of technology 
don't believe that Mark Zuckerberg has any desire or interest to be culpable in a genocide. And so for me, more interesting than what we could think of as the normative questions are the questions about in the space where we all agree and where everybody's interests are aligned, except for a handful of terrible people, nonetheless, we don't seem to have the institutions necessary within and without companies to make the kinds of decisions and implement the kinds of policies to control even the absolute bottom, universally loathed content. And so what this book tries to do is to give a case for the development of institutions that can actually bring about widespread, effective, participatory content governance. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go to Jennifer next. Uh, Jennifer, you may have a little bit different perspective on this. What do you see as the free market role in content moderation? I think one of the things that's important to remember about these platforms is that they're serving different audiences and that as a result, you're going to see different responses when it comes to content moderation. So if you think about your own social media habits, you likely use different platforms for different things. You may use one to connect with friends and family, another one to stay in contact with your professional network, and another one just to look at pictures of cats or, or whatever your, your kind of fun interest of choice is. There also is the element that when we talk about social media platforms, we're not just talking about those household names that you may think of. There are some platforms that are very specific, serving very specific groups that might have otherwise um, have been silenced and see themselves very much as a, a minority and, and need to have that opportunity to connect with each other in spaces that they might not have had in traditional media. So we've seen that technology can be incredibly empowering in allowing people to have very important conversations that in a prior era wouldn't have happened at all, certainly wouldn't have been able to get the attention because of various barriers. So one example I always think of is kind of things like the Me Too movement of the fact of, of how would you be able to get this type of information through traditional media in a way that you saw really gather steam online and be able to engage in a very important conversation that had previously not been be able to engage in. When it comes to this kind of question of, well, what do we do about some of the more problematic content, I think there are two things to, import, uh, to highlight. One, the amount of content that we all agree is problematic is much smaller than I think the average user things. And I always like to do a, an example of how quickly we can get into gray areas here. Um, and that is, there at least used to be, I need to confirm whether or not it still exists, a Reddit forum that the Reddit subforum's official rule was it is for pictures of cats standing up. Everyone have it in your head now, cats standing up. Simple rule, right? Do cats stand up on two legs or four? There probably is a split in this room about how many legs is a cat standing up on. That, I just gave you a very simple content moderation rule and told you to apply it. Now think about things that are much more nuanced. Is this about a viewpoint or is this something more complicated? This is the type of thing we're seeing debated with some of these government interventions particularly. And when it comes to those private platforms as well, the way they choose to deal with these disputes is going to look very different how Wikipedia deals with the dispute versus how Meta deals with the dispute versus how um, Twitter deals with the dispute are all going to be slightly different, in part because they're serving slightly different audiences and are going to have slightly different market signals that they're responding to. Shannon, I'll go to you next. Uh, much of your research focuses on social media and politics. So what do you think would be the, or should be the main focus of content moderation and how does that fit in with users' political ideology? Yeah, um, so I'm glad you sort of brought up the example uh, of Myanmar. I think, you know, I'm gonna bring up one that's maybe a little bit more into the gray area, not quite as much as like how do cats stand, but maybe somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, you know, I think there are a lot of disagreements around, you know, 
what content moderation should look like along political lines, and I'll share some sort of public opinion numbers in a minute. Um, but I do think that, you know, uh, in the wake of 2016 and, and coming into 2020, we did see a lot of platforms put up guardrails in the U.S. around democratic and election-related mis- and disinformation and sort of acting as some of these institutions, I think that sort of Paul is arguing for, you know, this is part of our role is just to uh, ensure that we still have this democratic experiment sort of happening. Can social media solve all our democratic ills? Uh, no, absolutely not, right? But they do have like other sort of, uh, you know, forms of media, institutions, a role to play. Um, in the wake of 2020, you know, I guess, you know, I don't know, by like, March or, or, or April, the platforms decided we have no more you know, problems and, and so they've mostly rolled back these sort of uh, policies that they had around election related mis and disinformation. Um, and so I think, that sh- I think that's wrong. I think that should be one of our focuses. Um, and I think we can define that in ways that uh, don't have to be you know, super controversial. If you lie about where a, the time and place of voting, right? If you uh, engage in action that is designed to suppress someone's vote in terms of you know, telling them that they can't vote around a particular issue or election. That's not how democracy works. And so I think that could be one of the focuses of our content moderation. Now, how do people feel about that? How do we define those things? I think that's where we get into things that are a little bit more complicated. Um, And so, you know, there's some recent work uh, by Pew that shows that most people do think that tech companies and not the government should engage in content moderation uh, around false information and around sort of violent uh, and hateful speech online. Um, When we think about government regulation, I want to agree with the keynote that I think we have to make sure to check our priors and make sure that we're our designing you know, tools, whether it's through the government or whether through platforms, that a change in leadership or ownership doesn't you know, give those tools to someone who may say have a more authoritarian or even uh, nay genocidal sort of uh, bent in them. Um, but we do see a partisan split you know, between Democrats and Republicans in terms of uh, how much they favor this. Um, unsurprisingly, of course, uh, Democrats are much more in favor uh, in terms of content moderation restrictions um, by both the government and tech companies as opposed to most people who identify as Republicans. Um, but I want to say, even though we're in D.C., uh, that it's not actually just a simple partisan split. Um, in the summer of 2021, I worked with the Knight Foundation and Gallup Uh, And we fielded a survey uh, where we asked 10,000 Americans a bunch of different questions, um, including a bunch of questions around, um, you know, who should be responsible for content online? And we didn't ask this sort of directly, but but laid out a series of questions that had trade-offs where people were answering basically, you know, I think it should be more about the companies, I think it should be more about the government, or I think it should be up to individuals, right? Like people should be making these decisions on their own and there shouldn't be any input from the platform companies or from the government. Um, we found that about half of, half of all Americans do fall along sort of, you know, what we might think of as sort of standard partisan lines. So 30% of people, you know, who tended to be more liberal, tended to be Democrats, did support government regulation around the most harmful content online. And about 19% of people who tended to be Republican and more conservative supported no government regulation or moderation from tech companies. But another 50% of Americans, so a whole other half of Americans, the picture wasn't quite that simple. These people were clustered in different ways that didn't really line up with partisanship around who should have the responsibility for harmful, violent, and dangerous things online and the trade-offs between whether it should be up to us as individuals, whether it should be up to governments, or whether it should be up to platform companies. So I just want to have us all remember that it's not actually as simple as this is what Republicans think and this is what Democrats think, that there's a whole other sort of gray area in terms of how these things play out for people across different platforms and how they're thinking about it. Great. Well, Paul, you get to turn back the clock. Yeah. So we're going to go to Athenian law now, make that transition <laughs> from the present to the past. What would the ancient Greeks say about the current state of affairs in social media? So I actually think there's a relevance here, believe it or not. And this is not just because I do this work. You know, I'm teaching a seminar on classical Athenian law right now. It took me years to convince anybody to let me do that, but I finally get to. But you know, so there's a couple things, right? So one is I think it turns out that the Athenians were really aware of the problem of managing 
the flow of knowledge in democratic societies. And I mean, they really give us some great examples of this. So for example, if you, for those of you who might be affiliated with the military, at some point, if you went to a military academy, somebody probably made you read Thucydides, I assume. Um, I hope, maybe I'm overly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, part of what Thucydides says is leads to the first fall of the Athenian democracy and to the rise of the, the 400, the oligarchy, is a campaign of disinformation and particularly a polarizing campaign of disinformation, one intended by the would-be oligarchs to sow distrust among the populace about their own democratic commitments. You know, one wonders if Vladimir Putin himself read Thucydides and applied the lessons in his own intelligence agencies. <laughs> but more than that, I think that, you know, a lesson that we can learn from the Athenians, and this is something that I'm shamelessly stealing from one of the faculty who was on my PhD committee back in what seems like the dark ages now. Um, a professor at Stanford named Josiah Ober wrote this fabulous book called Democracy and Knowledge, about how the institutional design of Athenian democracy, the way that it put ordinary people into, act into interaction with one another in a way that was structured, quite consciously probably, to bring it about that people with different kinds of knowledge would be located together with ways that gave them the incentive to leverage that knowledge was a substantial contributing factor in the success of Athens. Why is this relevant? Well, because one of the claims that I make in this book is that the failure of knowledge, and particularly the difficulty, you know, since I'm in a libertarian crowd, you know, think of Friedrich Hayek and one of his great insights being that centralized governors, be they governments or companies in Menlo Park have really severe difficulties in bringing knowledge about needs and about what's going on from the peripheries. And so I think that Athens can actually give us a case or contribute to a case for empowering ordinary people across the road to do, across, well, across the world, I'm also very sleep deprived, <laughs> <laughs> to participate themselves in platform governance. And you know, I have, as I said, you know, chapter six of this book, you can read it for free, there's an open access version, gives a program for this. But you know, the idea of democracy being a design to improve the use of knowledge and governance is I think the key lesson we can take from Athens. Thanks for that. I'll bring up the Constitution again that I talked about in my opening remarks. And the First Amendment makes no stipulation about speech is that, that is wrong, untrue, or part of a conspiracy theory. So Jennifer, how do we keep free speech principles in mind during content moderation? So there are two kind of debates when it comes to the, the First Amendment and content moderation. And I actually want to pick up on something that Paul said, because I do think we are seeing this decentralized approach be tried by various platforms. We've seen it with Twitter, now X's community notes, also Wikipedia and how Wikipedia chooses to arrive at truth when there are these editorial debates is a great example of how we've seen this kind of knowledge sharing actually play out in the social media age. But when it comes to the First Amendment, we have to distinguish between the rights of users and the fact that these platforms themselves have First Amendment rights. And oftentimes in this debate, just like how Section 230 somehow becomes shorthand for everything I'm mad about about content moderation, regardless of what I'm actually mad about, the First Amendment or the idea that my First Amendment rights have been violated can also become one of those shorthands of I'm mad that X decision happened when it actually may or may not have involved the First Amendment. So when we're talking about the First Amendment, we are talking about the government's role in speech. So one of the ways we've seen this really come up recently are questions around job owning of when is government pressure too much um, where it does become the government intervening in speech, as well as this kind of question going to the social media laws that were brought up of can the government have a role in regulating social media. 
to go to the latter of those, I think it is important to think about these platforms of what would it be like if these were offline platforms. So when we're talking about the government stating the rules for what content a platform must carry, which is what most of these laws would do, is they say you must carry certain speakers or you must carry certain types of content. Think about it uh, if that were to be applied to an offline coffee shop with a private room. We would be very concerned if all of a sudden the government was coming in and dictating that you had to offer your private room to the standard um, and we're seeing government intervention into the speech that way. Somehow though, we've seen some people forget that these are private platforms making private decisions about the speech that they choose to host. And so yes, I think there is a real First Amendment concern when we look at some of these laws to either change Section 230 at a federal level or at a state level, not with regards to just the individual user's speech, but to the, with regards to the First Amendment rights of these platforms themselves. This would, however, impact users because users would experience a very different change in how they um, experience platforms. Section 230 was largely designed to overcome the moderator's dilemma, which our keynote alluded to a bit earlier, but the idea of in a world where it's unclear what a platform's First Amendment rights are around content moderation, where they're going to have to litigate these concerns, you're gonna see one of two scenarios, most of which neither of us like as users. The first, which I think is the most likely in many of the cases, particularly at the major platforms, is you're gonna see something where every single post is scanned before it goes live. That real time element of social media that can be so powerful and so bonding and is so important when news is breaking and people are trying to process what's going on would effectively go away. The second is one that is a world that also most of us wouldn't like, but already exists in some places on the internet, which is a world where you have no content moderation at all. Where the risk of litigation, even if you were to be vindicated in court under a First Amendment stance, is high enough that platforms just say, I don't wanna do this anymore. I'm getting out of the, the game of content moderating. No lifeguard on duty, post whatever you want. And most people will, who've seen spam on their social media feeds would know how quickly that would disintegrate into a world that most of us wouldn't find productive either. Shannon, I'll let you continue the subject on government and politics. What kind of regulatory and legislative solutions would you recommend for the federal government to impose to reduce the level of misinformation and disinformation? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that we should have things at, you know, certainly I think the patchwork uh, mentioned earlier sort of across states is really problematic. Um, I think, you know, at the federal level, some things, even though it might eliminate that sort of patchwork problem, become, of course, more problematic, right? Um, but I do, you know, I, I'm not... I'm not sure exactly the path to get there, uh, but in the way that Section 230 was sort of crafted as a, like an incentive for the platforms to make good decisions <laughs> around like moderation, right, and to not be to not not moderate at all, so that you know making a making there an incentive to do so. I wonder like what if we can think of pathways to again encourage platforms to make good decisions around, you know, as Paul mentioned, some of the very sort of, you know, it, this is not a wide net, but of, around some of the very small things that we can agree on, you know, are important uh, for us to be able to, you know, moderate. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's really tricky about this, um, and, and, you know, I think companies need reminders of this sometimes, uh, as does the press, that like they don't really work out and exist very well if we don't have a democracy. Right, like they are set up to operate in a democracy, and if we no longer have a democracy, we don't have a great market. We don't have a great press, right? And so, whether it's through sort of legal means or through other means, there, you know, this is something that I think we need to remind uh, companies and media companies. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, as a social scientist myself and and lots of other people have been trying to figure out, like, what can we do, right? Like, what are some of the things? to reduce misinformation, to reduce the impact of misinformation. Um, on the impact side of things, it's really hard. Um, and then sort of, I guess, as a person, I'm pretty 
against the idea that this is a problem that should be individualized right to people to solve because um, it's not like on their own like well I don't know there's just a bunch of terrible stuff you figure out how to make sure none of it impacts you um, I think that's a hard you know thing to sort of be our only solution um, but one of the things that we do know that works from sort of a, a evidence-based perspective uh, is deplatforming, right? And so deplatforming, and, and we saw this, you know, uh, we've seen this in multiple different cases, um, is really powerful because then there is sort of not that, there's just not that voice, right? Spreading genocidal information, et cetera. Um, and I think what makes these decisions really, really hard uh, for companies, um, you know, technology and social media companies, is that it's not usually someone like me. You know what I mean? Like if somebody deplatforms me, there's not gonna be a news story about it. There's not gonna be like political implications, right? If my if my X account or my Blue Sky account just gets taken away. But also what I say on X or on Blue Sky isn't able to like incite coups, right? Uh, or lead to genocide. And so the really tricky thing is that it's the people with the most power, both online, but I think even more importantly offline, that are often the voices that end up being subject to this decision about moderation in the in the really sort of high stakes moments and so i have a lot of sympathy like those are hard you know those are hard decisions right because is there a financial you know blowback to that is there a sort of reputation blowback to that we've certainly seen that um but i do think that again there are these like small you know narrow places where we can agree that if we just want to continue this experiment in democracy and i for one think it would be really cool if we could do that i have a 12 year old i'd like it to go on for a little bit longer even than my life ideally um, just from a very sort of self-centered perspective um, that you know we create some type of incentives to have platforms operate you know with some democratic guardrails um, I'm not a politician, I'm not even a legal scholar, I don't have a law degree. I don't know what that looks like, you know what I mean, in terms of how to get there, but I think that is my ideal like end goal, is that there's just some sort of really strong incentive for platform companies to make decisions to preserve democracy. All right, this is getting good, because I'm gonna put you all in a position of power. We're on Capitol Hill, so what advice would you give policymakers and legislators or congressional staff advice to combat misinformation and disinformation and other harmful practices on social media? Okay, so first I think we probably can mostly agree that most direct content-based regulation is right out. Um, I mean, maybe not all, again, like sort of deplatforming of like particularly terrible situations maybe, but I mean, I think both in terms of restrictive regulation and in terms of what we think of as like coercively permissive regulation like the Texas and Florida laws, I think clearly violate the First Amendment. Um, they, I honestly am not convinced there's a serious debate there. But that doesn't mean that even the US government doesn't have a lot of policy levers. And so I want to tell you a story. I apologize for the slight indirection of this, but I think it will illustrate one of the policy levers and the way we ought to start thinking about these problems. So I don't remember what year it was, 2018, 2019, you know, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines really starts going nuts. Right, and one of the ways in which he starts going nuts is he abuses, once again, it's another sort of Facebook with a monopoly over the internet situation because of the sort of free basics program, long story. But, you know, Duterte, again, abuses Facebook in this dictatorial way to intimidate his political opponents. And shortly at thereafter, all those stories break about this. You know, there's this news story that just leaps out at me, which is, you know, Facebook, for the first time ever, according to all the reports, is staffing up an office in the Philippines so that they can, you know, be less blindsided by the sort of behavior of the Duterte regime. Here's the thing about that. Facebook had employees in the Philippines for years before that. It's just that those employees were outsourced content moderators who had zero way to actually communicate and you know, teach the company, teach the central governors 
what was going on, zero way to suggest policy reforms, zero way to exercise any control over their own environments, either in their workplace or their countries. And so, what does that suggest as a policy lever? Well, here's one totally content neutral policy lever that governments, including the US, could use. Companies need to treat offshore content moderators exactly the same as they treat FTEs in Facebook lingo, right? Like company employees that work in the building and have the badges with the nice collar rather than with the ugly collar. What does that mean, treat? In other words, you can regulate, for example, the number of layers of control between the frontline employees and people with policy making power. You know, you can regulate workplace conditions, you can regulate labor rights, you can regulate union rights, you know, countries like France have things like workers' councils that at least exist in the law even if they're not terribly well implemented, right? You can intervene in areas like labor law, in areas like, I hate to say it, competition law, to give companies an incentive to actually do a better job at their own goals of governing content. Jennifer, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I'd, li I'd like to jump in here. Um, so one thing I think is often neglected is there's this rush to regulation. And regulation brings with it a lot of concerns because we do have to consider what happens when the person you most disagree with now is the one that gets to dictate what's misinformation. What happens when the person that does not want to use this power in the way that you think is appropriate suddenly decides that this topic is off limit. So I think oftentimes a more sensible approach is to lean more heavily on education rather than regulation. And that can mean things like informing people about how to be more media literate, particularly when it comes to a lot of the concerns we're starting to hear around generative AI. How the same way we saw, you know, a century ago, centuries ago with the Photograph, we're going to have to teach people how to understand what this means so that they can make the decisions about the content they're interacting. You know, I, I'm a millennial, which I am regularly reminded on the internet now means I'm old. Um, <laughs> but when I was growing up, you were told if you saw something on the internet to go cross check that with another source. Maybe we need to have those same kind of conversations, not only with young people today, but with some of the older people who didn't grow up on the internet, with what do you do when you see a headline and think, hmm, that sounds a little fishy, or hmm, I'm not sure about that. We've seen different platforms take different approaches because the other reason I bring up education for in, instead of regulation is what the response looks like is going to look different on each platform. As I mentioned in one of my comments earlier, we often like to think that we're just talking about Facebook or we're just talking about Twitter. Particularly when these conversations come up in DC, we hear a lot about Twitter now X, which is actually significantly smaller than people realize. It's a very in the beltway kind of platform in the term, and it has certain very high profile people on it. But in terms of its actual presence in the market, it's much farther down than people may realize. So we have to think not only how does this impact something like Twitter, how does this impact one of those Reddit sub forums again? How does this impact new platforms that may be trying to emerge and compete with these existing platforms? One of the great things about Section 230 and the approach we've generally had to content moderation of allowing the market, because I don't think that any platform really wants to be known as the place that's full of misinformation and hate speech. I may be wrong, but I don't think that that's going to work out well for you with users or advertisers in the end. The, because of that, there are a powerful market incentive to respond, but the response is going to look different. And particularly the next platform may look different than the current iteration of platforms when it comes to how they deal with certain difficult questions. Shannon, you want to try? Stab okay, at so I have my mic here at, uh, I'm talking to legislators. Okay, so uh, I, I think, uh, so first I want to say like to the idea of like education, right, and, and, and sort of like digital and online literacy, um, I think that is really important. Um, I think the social science is still a little bit like, Mm, 
on like what exactly, you know what I mean? Like what are the mechanisms that actually work um, in terms of getting people to, you know, look for other sources? Oh, what keywords are you using? Oh, that might not, you know what I mean? Like we're, I think that's a good path, but we're still working on like what are, you know what I mean? What would be sort of the curriculum, right? For something like that. Um, but I think even with education, then we're still gonna need policymakers because we would need a lot of money to implement those you know, new curriculums and, and things in schools. Um, so, you know, to I think to both those points, you know, that's something that still the government would be involved in, even if it's not directly saying this is content is what can exist and this content, you know, isn't something that can exist. I think these indirect levers are, are certainly the more sort of promising way forward. Um, I also, so I think that policymakers and legislators should sort of think uh, beyond social media uh, when it comes to democratic harms. Um, I think that what we see on social media uh, reflects, can exacerbate, et cetera, all of these things that we're, that we're here discussing. Um, but this is not the primary place where like the bad things are happening. Like genocide or a coup can be incited in part through social media, but that's not where it actually happens, right? And so I think that you know legislators need to keep in mind this sort of what else happens? So like what is the context around and within which social media is taking place? Um, so for example, you know, there are efforts at the federal level um, to hold you know, those who incited and participated in the attempted coup on January 6th underway. Um, social media played a role in that, absolutely, but that's not the fundamental thing of what happened was not on social media, right? It was like what actually happened sort of on the ground. Um, but I also think it's really important to think about non-election related content, even as a person who studies politics. Um, policymakers need to remember, you know, in the sort of same vein that not all our ills can be uh, blamed on social media, although I think it is like a very uh, nice sort of scapegoat a lot of the time. Um, there's a lot of attention, for example, on the Hill right now being played to the role that social media plays in the mental health of young people and children. Um, I think this is a really important problem, I'm, you know, it deserves attention. Um, but I think it's really worth considering there's a host of, first of all, other more pressing issues that might make young people report being deeply anxious and concerned and depressed uh, that they might see on social media but are not just a social media problem. Lack of representation, global warming, civil rights issues. Um, and so we see these problems reflected on social media. Um, and I just wanna note, you know, again, sort of one of the things that I was talking about earlier, this big survey that we did, huge majorities of people also report that they receive a lot of benefits from being on social media as well, right? So vast majorities of Americans say that social media makes it easier for them to connect with friends and family, to connect with people who share their interests, to stay engaged in their community, to find information that they need. And this is especially important sort of going back to young people who might find themselves you know, in a family, in a community, in a place where there are not people like them or people who may even be hostile to people like them. Um, I lived in Utah for three years. I was a professor at the University of Utah. Um, and Utah, you know, has passed a bill that says you have to be 18 to have access to social media. And I think about especially student, you know, young kids, middle schoolers, elementary school kids who are in a place where they may find themselves in, you know, in a really socially or religiously conservative place but are thinking, I feel like this is not, you know what I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't have my autonomy respected. You know, they're questioning their gender identity, their sexual identity. This is a place where people can find community, right, through social media, even if they might not have it around them sort of physically within their family or in their place. And I think that's an important thing for people to be able to, to access. So um, those are some of the things that I think about that I wish other people paid attention to. Sure, thanks. Okay, now let's take a trip in our minds to Silicon Valley and pretend we're talking to the social media platforms and the management of the social media platforms, and specifically the online yeah. content moderators at one of the major social media platforms. What would you say to online media content moderators? Um, can I take the management one? What do you, what do you, can no, you, management of the worker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can choose whatever. Yeah, but the, because I, I mean, I think, again, I, and I mean, I know I'm like sort of hyper focused on structural changes here, but, you know, here's another one. So, so for something very simple, right? Like separate lobbying from content policy. 
Um, this is something that I think many, many people have said. No, I sound like Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think it, it's, a, again, another example of a sort of simple structural change that you can make. You know, it's an intervention in effect on companies' own incentives, right? So, you know, it's also a familiar policy lever in the corporate context. Think about Sarbanes Oxley and similar type of tools that, again, intervene on the internal decision-making structure of companies. But for companies, why does this matter? Well, it matters because when you're trying to actually make content policy to satisfy your own democratic values and your own democratic as well as, as you rightly say, economic interests, being in a position to be intimidated by governments, whether those governments are the Modi regime in India or the Trump regime in the United States, um, if you can alter your own institutional structure so as to at least partially insulate yourself from that intimidation, it's a pretty good chance that that's both profitable and more compatible with your own values. So I, I have two things that I would say in kind of this topic. The first is that companies have to make hard decisions. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And there are going to be consequences in the market with your users of getting it wrong. And that's not a bad thing because how you learn about the impact of decisions to hopefully make better decisions next time is sometimes you have to make mistakes. Maybe it's my former elementary school teacher <laughs> self coming out here that sometimes you've got to rework the problem in order to learn from some of the, the mistakes you made in the past. As our keynote was kind of alluding to, look, I'm sure we all have a full list that's probably different from each other of content moderation decisions that if I was the one in charge, I would have chosen to do X instead of Y. But you know what? We probably all have a slightly different list of if I was in charge, I would have taken X action sooner, or I would have waited to take X action, or I would have done Y instead of Z. I think that that's the reality and that's the benefit of our current marketplace is that we often see different platforms make at least slightly different decisions around what are oftentimes very difficult questions. The other thing though, I think to think about is the global context of this. Again, we heard about this a little bit and one of the kind of interesting questions that I have and have been contemplating is what's the tipping point? What's the tipping point when the compliance with a particular regulation impedes so much on a platform's speech right, on their ability to allow their users to use their platform in a way that's beneficial for their intended purposes to communicate or connect with one another that you say enough and pull out of a market? I think we're, it's going to be very interesting as we, we do see this debate happen in various contexts and we do see some increasingly heavy-handed regulation potentially on platforms ability to make these decisions if we will see those kind of consequences at any point. Got some advice? Oh, yeah, I mean, how long do we have? <laughs> uh, I'll be brief. So uh, I've said this before, so I'll say this quickly. If I'm talking to a content moderation manager, uh, put back in place the guardrails uh, designed to support in. Uh, democratic institutions. Um, remember that you know the decisions that you are going to have to make, like you said, are going to be really hard because it's users with the most power, political, social, economic, et cetera, who are the ones who you know are most often you know who are needing sort of this hard decision around some type of moderation. Um, and then lastly, I would say you know there's been a lot of focus uh, both in the social science world, uh, but I also know you know sort of within platforms as well about the role that content uh, and and algorithms designed to deliver that content plays in the way that folks are politically polarized. Um, and I would say that you know I don't think polarization is not a concern; it absolutely is, uh, but. That's not exactly sort of what we, I think we're actually seeing in our politics, and, and not just in the US, but in a lot of places. The problem is extremism. Um, and so I would sort of you know, ask them to, to shift the levers a little bit in terms of what are they trying to solve for uh, when they're making some of these content moderation decisions. Sure. The European Commission is after Elon Musk. As you know, X is on the naughty list in Europe. So the European Commission has strict measures, Paul, uh, on misinformation and disinformation reporting. Do you think that could come to the United States? I, 
again, I mean, I'm skeptical about even when we're talking about reporting, and, and so I have to admit that I don't have a firm view on this, but I think there's a reason in the US context to sort of start off with a stance of skepticism, even for sort of content-based reporting type obligations. I mean, it does seem to me that at the very least, this is sort of questionable from First Amendment grounds. I'm going to try to not editorialize on Elon here too. Sure. If I can jump in on this question too, I think there's also an underlying question of is this going to de facto come to the United States? Mm -hmm. Are we going to see a Brussels effect on speech the same way we have seen on privacy where because it may be easier to institute one rule or because you're doing this already for, for this context, we're going to just apply it globally rather than have to have additional rules. And I think the question then is what does that mean for the Americans and the American users and for these American companies who have in the past really upheld this kind of broader speech standard but now are facing this incredible pressure? We get a lot of supply of misinformation and disinformation, but what about the demand side? What about the people who really like this stuff and want to listen to InfoWars and get their fill of misinformation? Is there a demand problem? Is there a supply problem? Let's take a look at that from the demand side. Do you want to address that, Paul or Chad? You're the calm scholar. <laughs> I mean, I think there certainly is uh, some demand for this, right? We see we see this very obviously, um, and I and I want to uh, I'm going to quote uh, one of my very good friends, and also wonderful scholar Danigal Young, um, who sort of outed herself a couple years ago with this great piece where she said, "I was a conspiracy theorist too," and she was talking about when her former husband was dying of brain cancer. You know, this very scary time in her life. Excuse <coughs> me. She was searching for an explanation. <coughs> Excuse me. When things are scary, we want to know why. And we <coughs> you go, Paul. Uh, okay. <coughs> totally, totally different take, and I still feel terrible interrupting that <coughs> due to exigency of coughing. <laughs> um, but I mean, so I think what's easy to overstate people's preferences for almost anything, right? I mean, you know, if there's ever an example of the adage that consumer preferences are <laughs> endogenous to markets, it's the consumption of content in what I think, I mean, frankly, for a lot of users, is like kind of mindless, right? I mean, you know, do some consumers have a preference for, you know, conspiracy theories? Sure, I'm sure they do, right? Do, is, Consumer behavior dominated by more <laughs> basic questions about how they use their time, about the sort of incentives given to them by recommender systems, so on and so forth. Maybe. Can we possibly disentangle those things? Probably not. All right, we have time for one more question, so I'm going to do a lightning round. <laughs> so favorite social media platform and why? I, I don't know that I have a, a, a favorite and I will say it varies on, as I kind of said at the beginning, <laughs> it varies on what I'm going for, you know, type of thing. So if I'm, you know, casually scrolling versus trying to get my work out there versus, you know, posting pictures of my cat, um, then it's going, going to, to vary. So I, what I like is how many different platforms there are and also the new ones I'm discovering. So some of my Gen Z friends got me on Be Real recently, which is kind of a very new and unique approach to social media where you can't passively scroll. You have to post in order to participate. So to some of these questions, it'll be interesting to see how some of these debates may evolve with a platform like that. Truth social, no, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> um, I, I have to admit, right, so every academic, 
right, sort of starts off as a Twitter person. I mean, you know, because Elon, I don't think, I, at least I can't be that anymore. I mean, side note, I am going to editorialize slightly on Elon here and say, you know, quintessential example of the proposition that every billionaire is a policy failure, like when economic incentives just don't apply to you anymore, and so you can torch $44 billion of value for funsies by not doing content moderation at all, basically. I mean, that seems like a problem. You know, I, I'm going to out myself as a non-libertarian by saying Elizabeth Warren should just use all of that as an ad for a wealth tax. <laughs> um, but, you know, b because of the fall of Twitter, I've sort of gone all in on Blue Sky, so there we are. Yeah, uh, Blue Sky for news, politics, and like my other dorky work stuff. And then uh, I have trained my algorithm uh, for TikTok to just be like puppies, raccoons, <laughs> possums, <laughs> like the kitten distribution system. Uh, and it's like my, f that is absolutely my favorite uh, place at the moment. Fans of MySpace out there. I'm dating, <laughs> dating myself a little bit. All right, well, let's wrap that up. We have a time for a couple of questions, maybe? Uh, yes, sir. Wait for the mic. Is going to come to you real quickly here? I'm Mike Nelson at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I really enjoyed this. But I'm a technologist, <laughs> not a lawyer. I've been impersonating a policy person for 30 years here, but... Damn it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> We are inside the Beltway. We're right you know, within spitting distance of the Capitol, so I understand the focus on law and regulation. But I worked for Cloudflare. I have worked for IBM. There are technology solutions that could do so much here, particularly if we could actually harvest the wisdom of the cloud, which is what we said when I was in the Clinton White House and still believe. I'm still a cyber libertarian optimist Democrat. What laws could be changed to facilitate more crowdsourcing solutions. Right now, there are so many laws that get in the way of actually letting people actually comment and help, help sort through this mess. You can get sued if you give a bad Yelp review. We don't have good authentication, so we don't know who's writing these reviews. There's just so many ways that we could be so far ahead of this problem and not have to hire 5,000 people in the Philippines. And I would like to comment, the American Revolution would not have happened without disinformation. I mean, I would just say, so w like you, not a law scholar. So I'm not going to say whether, you know what I mean, any of these things. I, I don't know the sort of policy or legal solution side of things. But I do think that, you know, some of what, some of what you're saying you know, reminds me of this idea that like one of the things that I think is a little bit like oh, for me is like the public doesn't really have a voice in these questions that we're, you know what I mean, talking about right now. Um, if, if we're saying, you know, like a, not, I don't mean they should have a direct voice, like individuals making content moderation decisions. I don't think that's good whether you're a billionaire or not. I don't think it should be me better than Elon or Mark. I, sh I don't think it should be a single person, right? Um, but I do think we need to think about the ways that the public can have more of a voice in this um, and, and, you know, and not at just like the, or, you know, I mean, I live in North Carolina, not at just my very, very jandy, gerrymandered, you know, congressional level, like some other type of voice, because I do think that's something that's lacking um, and contributes to the lack of trust, I think, in this. But individuals do have a voice on Reddit and Wikipedia. Yeah. They're just kind right. of talked by all these trolls and, in some cases, governments. Well, so, I mean, then, that, that, then that's a clue, right? So one is, to some extent, this is a matter of product design. Right, I will admit, you know, I actually like the community notes thing. I hate to praise anything happening on Twitter right now because of my <laughs> loathing for Elon, but I'll, I'll, I'll give him that one. No, uh, they, they shipped before he bought it. Did they? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You've saved me from praising Elon. Um, but I mean, I, so, so leaving aside the product design category, right, I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity that is sort of in the dark corners, really more of political science than of law, of like ideas to directly create like institutions that empower ordinary people, right? So like, um, you know, there's an old literature by like Jim Fishkin and Robert Luskin. There's got this sort of idea of like deliberative polls, only like political theory wonks like 
like it. Um, I'm a political theory wong, sue me. Um, but I mean, you know, uh, but I think it's sort of been replicated. So like some of the nonprofits in the space, like Article 19 is going all in kind of on like arguing for these sort of social media councils, right? Like you know, uh, every once in a while, one of the companies tries to create something like this. So like that you, you can build like artifactual institutions to take ordinary people, educate them a bit, and then ask them to make decisions. Like, we do have that capacity. Sometimes we do it. Sometimes it works. One more question? Yeah, Josh. <clears throat> yeah, Josh Levine from the American Action Forum. I'm going to build on Mike's question a little bit. I uh, would love to hear panelists' opinions on Francis Fukuyama and some other people's uh, thoughts on middleware. Uh, an alternative layer that you put between some of the edge providers, social media platforms, and ISPs give content individuals more control over their content, more discretion in what they see uh, with open source and generative AI exploding right now. Coders, even the lowest levels, can you know build things they couldn't two, three years ago. So what do you see as, I know, you know Computer Fraud Abuse Act, there are things that prevent data portability, but what are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, I think we are seeing in some circles at least decentralization be put forth as a alternative to kind of the more traditional top-down content moderation approach. I know that doesn't exactly go to your question, but kind of to, to both of the questions. I also, though, think this does raise this interesting dynamic that I always like to point out about when we're talking about regulation and technology. Of Regulation is a static tool, and technology moves very quickly. So at times when many of these regulations were written, while the in the late 90s we saw an incredible light touch approach that tried as best as it could to, to only regulate on the margins, even with things like the evolution of the cloud, with the evolution of uh, various platforms, what we've seen is that there may be regulations that were well intended that actually need to be updated to allow more things that could improve, say, the cloud's usage or could improve cybersecurity or could improve data privacy to talk about one of my other favorite topics to, to talk about. But if we do this from a top-down legislative approach, the problem is we're usually presuming technology is, is as it is today, and technology rarely, if ever, stays just as it is today, and there's the question of what are we losing in that process. Anything else? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the middleware ideas are really, like, interesting, right, in terms of, like, how that can give people the sort of agency to have the experience that, you know what I mean, that they're looking for, even if someone's not giving it to them, you know, in sort of a major platform way. Um, I think one of the, though, like, I guess one of the concerns, and this is not a reason not to do it, but just a thing to think about with it, though, is, like, that's then even, like, another layer of us all having different experiences and different information systems. And so I think about, like, you know, it, it's not a question of, like, should we or should we not, but, like, what are the cases when that's, like, a desirable thing from like a normative democratic perspective and when is that maybe not a desirable thing, right? Like when are the, when are the what are the architectures for when we wanna have a shared experience and when do we not? You know, when is it not necessary to have a shared experience? So I think it's just like something I think about, you know, in terms of sort of the, the middleware question. Okay, parting, parting thoughts, parting shots. Okay, put your hands together for our panel. <clears throat>